We've been working with Matrix Press with a, a collaborative arrangement over the past two years, as many of you have seen, bringing in a series of four artists for a one-week residency uh, at, the, at the Matrix Press at the University of Montana. And it was really born out of a desire to, to be involved with the, uh, the generative aspect of art making without having the facilities here at MAM to really have a full-on residency. So we talked to Jim Bailey and he graciously uh, agreed to, to carry the weight of this project forward with his hard work. Um, and, and then we partnered also with the School of Art with the Jim and Jane Do Visiting Artist Lecture. So I'm really excited that this is presented in conjunction with that lecture series, uh, and we're very grateful for that. It's, it's been a really good partnership, and we've been able to do some exciting projects together, uh, bringing in Sarah Seastream, Molly Murphy Adams, and then John Hitchcock, and we have Dwayne Slick coming uh, the second week of February next year, so we're, we're hope, hopeful that that's all going to work out. That will culminate in an exhibition called The Shape of Things, indigenous approaches uh, to abstraction. So we're, we're looking forward to the, having that exhibition created from scratch by visiting artists to Missoula and kind of responding to the particularities of, of the uh, Matrix Press in the, in, in the Missoula area. Uh, John is really a fascinating artist and it was, it was born out of this conversation back and forth with Jim and, Jason and Matrix Press about what, what kind of artists, what caliber artists we would like to bring in for this residency program. And at some point, his name was suggested, and, and I think Jim had come across him previously at a Southern uh, Graphics Conference, and, and it seemed like a natural fit. And as we invited him to come up to Missoula, just on a lark, sent him a, a blind email out of the blue, seeing if he wanted to give up a week of his life to, to come to Missoula and make artwork, he immediately and graciously responded yes, and we were almost grateful for that. I found him to be uh, an extremely flexible and willing artist from the beginning and, and really wanting to engage, um, very committed to education, and very committed to community, just in their brief conversations. And so we got off on the, the right foot and uh, met each other and, and traveled north and did a studio visit with Corky and Linda, uh, which was really nice, and then visited Salish Kootenai College and, and kind of talked about some things that were uh, near and dear to our hearts. John's Comanche heritage informs his printmaking, and it was on that drive north to the reservation that he talked about developing the imagery in his prints. Um, and really, the, the first, his first steps at drawing were in translating his, his grandmother's bead designs. She would show him different bead patterns and say, uh, this is what I'm interested in, and, and John was the, the scribe. And I, that really struck me as a, a very organic and natural way to, to engage with shape at a very young age. And, and kind of as the foundation, I believe, for the prints that he's doing at Matrix Press. He has a, a notable um, list of, of exhibitions and collections that he's involved in. I'll let him delve into that because he's, he's lauded and vetted and the best of the best. We're really lucky to have him here in Missoula, Montana. So please help me in welcoming John Hitchcock. Thank you. I did hit pause there, but. Oh, I think I'm good. Okay. Can you all hear me okay? Let's see. Let's turn your mic on. I think I did it. I'm good. I'm good, right? So, can you hear me okay? Is there a microphone sound going down? I don't think so. All right, here we go. <laughs> no, it's there. All right, let me go up. Point it up a little bit. There we go. Here we go. Is that better? Yay. Can you hear? Um, thank you. Um, First, I want to say I'm very honored to be here and also very honored to be in this exhibition space with um, Jean Quick to see Smith's work. To me, that's like very powerful to me. It's because her work's very powerful, but she's also a very powerful artist who has influenced many, and, and me, me as well as a, as a little artist when I was young, <laughs> seeing her work. A little artist when I was young. Um, <laughs> It's just like, whoa, her work's all around us. It's so intense, and it's pretty powerful. So a little story about Quick to See. Um, I was teaching 
uh, just started teaching at University of, Minnesota, uh, University of Wisconsin Madison, and we had been we've never met, but we've been in contact by email back and forth for years. And she contacted me, and she had an exhibition in New Hampshire. It was a solo exhibition of her work. And she said she could not be there because she had so many commitments and could I come and represent her at her show and give a talk? And I'm like, whoa, this is heavy, okay. But she said, I have an assignment for you. I want you to research some American Indian artists that you don't know yet. And I, she gave me a few names and she said, I want you to find a few more and I want you to do your talk based on that. And so it really, that whole idea of community and the extension of community and that warmth of her asking me to do something but on the other end of it her saying that you need to think about these other artists and these younger artists and how are you going to help them as you move along and so that was very empowering. Um, I want to also thank uh, the, the Missoula Art Museum in particular Brandon for um, taking me out to to Corky's Claremont's uh, studio and also the uh, Salish Kootenai College yesterday. That was very empowering. And I also want to thank, thank Laura Millen and Greg Mentier for their awesome studio living space that's there. I'm a guitar player and there's a guitar in the room and I know I'm probably not supposed to touch it. I didn't, I didn't, but that guitar is like, yes, I'm in the right space. <laughs> And I want to also thank the print faculty, Jim Bailey, Elizabeth Dove, and Jason Clark for graciously helping in all the ways they do with, within our culture of printmaking and being out there and being responsible to keep the life of printmaking going in a lot of ways, but also the life of the, the younger generations that are being involved with it. And speaking of the younger generations, the assistants that are helping make the prints this week Darla, Shelby, and Carl, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because this has been an amazing, amazing two days. Little background by video first. So 
that was a print made in Vermilion Press and um, working with students there. And it sort of gives you a little bit about process, printmaking, contextualizing historical aspects with making. Music too, I'm a musician. I play in three bands currently, two kind of country bands and then one rock and roll band. The music that was played was done with a colleague on this video and was actually recorded with an iPhone, so it's really low tech, <laughs> very low tech and very monotonous. It was made up on the spot, recorded, done, sort of like how we're making the prints this week, on the spot, kind of being very, very, so printmaking is repetitive, that music is very monotonous and repetitive and so, it's, it's kind of how my head operates and how I work. Uh, first, I'm going to begin with a little bit of personal background. I grew up in the Wichita Mountains uh, on uh, Comanche tribal lands located next in the Wichita Mountains next to Medicine Park, Oklahoma. So the Wichita Mountains are the oldest mountain range in the continental United States. At one point, 2,000 years ago, they were larger than the Rocky Mountains. And they're one of very few mountain ranges that run east and west. Very beautiful place, um, very important to my upbringing. But it's also, those rocks have, have dwindled down to these giant stones, like rocks that stack on top of each other. The Wichita Wildlife Refuge, uh, there's a wildlife refuge basically located in the Wichita Mountains, and it was established in, in 1901. And the refuge provides a habitat for um, native grazing animals such as the North American bison, the elk, deer, and later longhorns were introduced. State Highway 49 separates my family's land from Fort Sill, the U.S. military base. And this is Mountain Scott, a very important mountain up to the Kiowa Comanche, Apache, and also the Cheyenne people and Caddo people too that live in that area. It's also in the Wichita Mountains, there's this thing called the Holy City. And so the Holy City is this recreation of what Israel looked like during biblical times. Very strange. <laughs> and the site of the nation's, nation's longest running Easter Passion Play called the Prince of Peace. So as a kid, I thought that's where Jesus lived, like for real. So I would go out there and, and we're like, wow, this is like, you see it on TV and you're like, this is like where Moses did all that stuff and this is where Jesus lived. It's like real. Jesus is real. Oh my gosh. In contrast, we have uh, right across the street from Highway 49 is the United States military base, Fort Sill. It's the largest field artillery installation in the western United States. Historically, this arm post was established as a 19th century Indian war, wars fort and it served as an internment camp for many indigenous leaders such as Geronimo, the Apache people, Chiricahua Apache, Sintaide, which sometimes is said Santana, is Sintaide of the Kiowa people, and Quanah Parker of the Comanche people. So this area is defined by the KCA, Kiowas, Comanches, and Apaches. And also these helicopters are named after them too. Imagine that, Kiowas, Comanches, and Apaches. Unfortunately, the Comanche helicopter was never reproduced as a, or maybe fortunately it wasn't, but 14 of them were made. Kiowas and Apaches are still being used this day, which brings up complications because of the idea of militarism, native identity and that relationship to war and warfare, but we'll go into that later. Oklahoma State Highway 49 separates my family's land, as I said. Uh, this place is important to me because it's a historical influence, but I remember an artist saying once that history is not complete because history basically, if you're still speaking the language, if you're still existing within your cultural context, then you're not history, you're living in the current. So that idea of that past versus the present versus the middle, it's ongoing. So I grew up with helicopters and tanks noisily driving by at night, um, seeing warfare happening like right outside on the other side of Highway 49. My father actually worked for the, the, the military and my grandfather was, my father was in the military and that's how he ended up at Fort Sill during the Korean War. My grandfather worked on tanks and helicopters during World War II and the Vietnam War and the Korean War. So as a kid in the 70s, watching 
Vietnam on TV. Again, I thought Jesus lived in the Wichita Mountains. The Vietnam War was right across the street because they're bombing and continually doing these things. So anyway, I love this sign. Help, help preserve our heritage. Do not climb on the weapons. <laughs> Yay, America. <laughs> so I, like I said, I, my, I come from a biracial family. My mother's side is Kiowa and Comanche from Oklahoma. My father's tribe is uh, German and Dutch from Michigan. Holland, Michigan, Northern European descent. Ended up at Fort Sill because of the military. So I, as an intercultural hybrid, like living in this increasingly global, shifting world, it's very important to me to look at communities and whatever community I am, but also the community that I came from and how that affects me. It's my, my grandmother, my grandfather here, and my grandmother's beadwork. As Brandon said earlier, um, I first learned how to draw from my grandmother. She gave me a, a piece of paper, which was actually a paper bag, and said, um, can you draw me a, a pattern? And I'm like, well, what pattern? She said, just draw a pattern. And so I kind of started to draw. Then she said, can you draw this pattern? And she showed me some beadwork, and she gave me examples. And then I drew these patterns. And then she said, can you draw a flower? So I draw a flower. And as I would do these drawings, I'm realizing she's like critiquing me. Like she's giving me an assignment, <laughs> and then she's telling me what I should and should, shouldn't do, but not telling me directly. It's like she's just sort of saying. And then at, by the end of it, I learned how to draw. Um, and so she would take my little drawings and make these beautiful medallions and beadwork out of them. So it was uh, a pretty honoring to be able to grow up with, with that experience. And, and, and they also, my grandmother, my grandfather sang at the drum, but my grandmother was also danced. She went to a lot, we had a lot of powwows we would attend, but also they held powwows on our, on our land. All right, to artwork, here we go. Different, the, the, this, this contemporary art context thing. This is called Ritual Device. Uh, it was done about 1999. It's got multimedia, video projection, these 50 chickens that are, um, you can throw Nerf balls at them, these balloons that you throw darts at and, and pop them, and series of videos, and this other piece, Fragments, where you can hoop the bottles. And the whole idea of game and participation and audience and how that functions became very important to me. Uh, these are commodities. Um, commodities are, this is the pork beef chicken, chicken cow pig. If you grew up on native lands, you've probably have most likely eaten these. If you grew up on a third world country, you may have eaten these as well. If you went through K through 12 education, public education, how many people have done that? K through 12 public education? <laughs> you've eaten these too. So we've all eaten them in some way in that participation. So I never thought about them much because that's what I grew up with. <laughs> Until I left after college, undergraduate, I moved to Dallas, Texas with the band I was in in the early 90s and we were pursuing trying to make it as musicians. And I brought this huge box full of commodities and all my bandmates were like, what the hell are those? And they were like, this is cool! And I'm like shaking it and it's got that weird sound with the meat in it. And you're like, yeah, this, this is really cool, but it's probably going to kill us. <laughs> and I never thought much about it until grad school. And so in grad school, I started to take the labels and use the imagery to make the artwork. And so taking the, the cow or the beef and turn, turn it into frozen ground fear, U.S. inspected and passed by the Department of Culture, established in 1492. So there's little hints of obvious political references here. Um, so when I opened that can, it wasn't a cold beer. It's just water. <laughs> um, so this is interactive. Every time I hear that sound, I'm like, oh wow, sounds like a cold beer, but <laughs> ritual device. One of the things to me about like going to indigenous events or a native event or a powwow is that honoring of different levels from youth to elders. And 
And in Oklahoma, there's this thing called the American Indian Exposition in any dark Oklahoma that I would go to since I was a little kid, like a baby, all the way to adulthood. And I continually try to go down to see the, the they call it the Indian Fair in Oklahoma, in Medicine Park, or in Andy Darko. And at the fair, they would actually have a big carnival that was going on, and then you'd have traditional hand games going on, and then you'd have things going on that, that go on. There's a lot of things that go on. And so taking that idea of that communal kind of community and that idea of, of interchange and, and game, I wanted to create these pieces where I would print, screen print, basically my propaganda, my information, and people would hoop the bottles and be able to take the little print away. This was at the North Dakota Museum in Grand Forks. It was a few years back. This is the Peacemaker. The Colt Peacemaker was the first multi-revolver six-shooter that was used to kill Comanche people. And to me, it's like the first weapon of mass destruction. And the first time I witnessed one was at Geronimo's guard cell house at Fort Sill when I was on a field trip in grade school. And I'm like, wow, that gun's cool. Because on the side of it, it had engraved images of cavalrymen with pistols shooting native people with headdresses. And the cool part wasn't the imagery, it was the fact that it was engraved. I was like, wow, what is that? Printmaking. Didn't know it, but it was printmaking. I'm like, wow, that's printmaking. Then I looked at the imagery and I'm like, oh my god, it's like listening to music and not listening to the lyrics, but you like the music? I'm like, I don't listen to lyrics, I don't know what they're saying, it doesn't matter to me. So it was the same way with the line. I was like, I'm looking at the line and I love the line, but I don't know what that's saying, I don't care, but I love it. And then when I started to kind of understand the methodology, I'm like, oh my god, they're killing the Indians and that's about this gun that relates to mass destruction because it's a multi-revolver and it was used to tame the West. Anyway, I did a, th a thousand of these little hand-cut guns and the guns were taken from, went to grad school in Lubbock, Texas, um, Texas Tech, and the gun was taken from this restaurant from a little coin-operated thing where you can get in a little bubble, you get toys, and it had a little toy pistol, it was this one, the Peacemaker. And so I scanned it and then screen printed a thousand of them and hand cut them and gave them all away. Uh, this was in Darmstadt, Germany. Uh, it's called the Forest Art Project and I was fortunate to be able to go there. It was post 9-11, 2001, I think. Um, this is at Fort Lincoln, which is located between the, the, the National Park and the town Darmstadt and this army base is a place where the troops were being shipped post, it was around 2002 I think I was there, when we invaded, when they were kind of in a midway point and they would come there and before they would come back to the United States. And so this project had to do with the idea of the, the commodity image again, but looking at the commodity as the com who's being commodified. So the chicken cow pig, doesn't only represent the target of indigenous culture, but also the target of the government, the military leaders, the, the actually military personnel, or even in an academic situation when I'm serving on a committee and they're like, let's, have, let's do a target hire. Like, what do you mean? Like, what kind of target? We're, who are we targeting? What level? A woman, a person of color, or what is this idea of, idea of an identity of that relationship of the target itself? And there was a nice little berry patch here, too, where you had to walk through this. And the military personnel would actually run through here, and they could go between the signs or behind the signs when they did their training. So in relationship to the piece in Darmstadt, Germany, uh, I put a piece in Lawton, or excuse me, on my grandparents' land in a Medicine Park off of Highway 49. So like I said earlier, Highway 49 separates Fort Sill, the military base, this side is our, our um, my grandmother's tribal lands, or our tribal lands. So our powwow grounds is actually back here. You can see the poles for the, the dance ground in the far background. And so this was a place for me, and that's very important because it's where I grew up, but to be able to put this political statement that's facing Fort Sill, the military base, 
and have it there and also in Darmstadt. And I think growing up in the country, in Oklahoma, like a country boy from Oklahoma, <laughs> that you don't succeed. If you put a sign with a target on it and nobody shoots it, then you, there's no success. <laughs> And I have to say, I was proud. I was at Quartz Mountain, Oklahoma, doing this talk, and I showed this piece. And during my visit there, I stopped by the house and saw the signs, and everybody's like, hey, they shot your signs. Somebody shot your signs. So that means whoever shot them had to be at Fort Sill shooting at them, because that's the military base. So a woman in the crowd comes up and says, hey, I know who shot your signs. I'm like, really? She goes, yeah, my son. He didn't shoot him, but my son's best friend they're getting shipped off to Iraq. And you know what? They wanted to go shoot those signs before they left. I'm like, whoa, that's heavy. <laughs> like, they actually came and shot the signs. And then the one in Darmstadt, again, I guess artists who do things publicly, um, you get, you, you, there's criticism, but there's also the idea of, like, if you do some signage or something, like, you hope that someone will like take it or do something with it and so the ones in Germany two of them have been stolen and so I've sent them new ones and they hang them up and so I've had two stolen it's the pig the pig's the one who got shot the pig's the one who actually got stolen too nobody wants the chicken or the cow it's okay all right I teach printmaking I teach screen printing and everybody asks like yeah, screen printing is easy. I'm like, yeah, it is. Look, I mean, you can, you can print on people. Like, it's it's crazy. Like, that's the thing I love about screen printing is that it's the most valued and undervalued medium. The the, like, the most expensive artwork, probably is not as expensive as it, it was. The most expensive artwork is an Andy Warhol, which is called Works on Paper, or actually, it's Works on Canvas, acrylic. It's actually screen printing. It's so basically screen printing. Um, the notion of screen printing and its ability to be able to be diversely used on any kind of surface and its use in the industry and probably the most exhibited medium in the Whitney Biennial over the whole time span of the Whitney Biennial. So everybody says that there's no printmaking in the Whitney Biennial for the, the reality. Yes, there is. It's screen printing. So the beauty of screen printing for me is it's also a community-based um, relationship. So I do a lot of projects with students, with people in the community, um, where we take a portable screen printing unit out into the community and do printing. And I have to give props to um, a group that came out of Madison, Wisconsin, who Tyler here actually traveled with them too as the Viking. Drive-by Press, which were some students that, that, were, that went to the UW-Madison in the grad program, and they had this idea of taking a press on wheels and going out into the community. And so that idea is still alive throughout print culture everywhere. They kind of did a nice revival of printmaking by traveling from city to city and doing mobile printmaking. And so my contributions is in any way I can too is to also promote that identity, but I have to also give props to Drive By because they are still around and still amazing and have done wonderful things for the community. This is um, a bicycle built and invented by Wes Olfig. Wes Olfig, who was also another Drive By press person who traveled around the United States. He lives in New York right now. He actually has a frame shop. He's pretty amazing. But he has this, group, uh, this um, bike company called Playdate. And so this is one of his bikes. And we, this was in Albu or Santa, no, Albuquerque, New Mexico, 516 Gallery. We did a big exhibition there. And we printed outside at the, the, the um, farmer's market. And Marwan Begay, Emily Arthur, and I did. So again, promoting that community-based effort of printing in public. The other thing is the whole idea of the ephemera and these smaller objects that can be politically loaded and used in subversive ways as stickers, magnets, for me felt, using felt. 
or little little pamphlet books. I actually have some books here. I'm going to pass them out. So I'm going to get my image in your, your pocket. <laughs> Can't fit it in the pocket, but here, take one and pass them around. Um, so the idea of being able to have the giveaway. And the giveaway, to me, stems back to that cultural reference of growing up, going to f homes of different tribal people and sharing song, dance, music, culture, and that gift of, of honoring someone by giving them something. And that's like very important within many cultures, but in particular indigenous cultures. And so that was the first approach for me to making art in a larger context was to have some form of giveaway to honor others. Uh, this is they're moving their feet but nobody's dancing in Syracuse. So stamina, longevity, pushing it, making prints. Like, the, like today, I think we made 120 prints that we're working on, and so that we'll go through them and keep working on them. And this was a piece that was done with Dusty Herbig at Syracuse. And what we did is we took the gallery over, and I wanted to do 24 hours and use the space and actually create an installation in that space within 24 hours. And on the left, you can see the space empty. And he got paper donated from the forestry department, who has a giant paper maker that's the size of this room. And we were able to use recycled paper that's been researched. And then it was also used in the print shop. So we had this huge stack of their paper and a group of students that helped with the project. And we started, I think, at 9 in the morning. And by the next day, 24 hours later, we finished this. And I didn't know at the time, I, I got really sick during the whole thing, but I made it through it. And I had a gallstone that like, I didn't know it was going down. But apparently it went down. And then the next week when I got back to Madison, I had to have an emergency gall bladder surgery. Like they took everything out. They said it was the largest gallstone they've ever seen. And, but we finished this project. <laughs> so there's helicopters representing the Fort Sill, the Kiowa Comanche Apache, the tanks representing again Fort Sill, the little tick marks, um, notions of ideas of war, how much money has gone into war, how many people have died, the idea of keeping track because America loves to keep track of things and the government likes to keep track of things and people like to keep track of things and so that reference of and printmakers love to keep track of things. We number our prints, so that it's all in line for me. This was another one called Collateral Consumption. It was at University of Maryland. And So when we first invaded Iraq, it was in the 90, early 90s, and late 80s, early 90s, was called Desert Storm. Desert Storm. And so when that happened, I was just finishing undergrad, and I was like, oh my god, I could be like drafted and go to war. Slayer, the band Slayer was very important to me. I was in, a, in the 80s and early 90s, I was in um, death metal ba bands. and. We played to the military personnel at Fort Sill, so they were very into Slayer. And we did all original music and Slayer, because you can't leave a show without playing Slayer. So Rain and Blood was a song that I was stuck in my head, and so I've been using that within the video context, which you saw earlier, but also in its relationship to military and this idea of like war and that sound and this, this notion of what it does. So also back to that, Fort Sill. I just got contacted by, by, by uh, this, uh, my art teacher, Juanita Pataponi, her nephew, just contacted me about 
looking into the sounds of war and the sounds of indigeneity. I'm like, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> the sounds of indigen indigeneity. I, like, I can't even say it. And I'm like, he said, you grew up in Fort Sill, like next to it. I'm like, I did. And we grew up with bombs going off my whole life. We grew up with machine guns going off. I remember moving to Dallas and being in Oak Cliff, Texas, pretty bad part of town where Stevie Ray Vaughan grew up, and I hear some machine guns. And my cousins were standing there looking at me, like waiting for me to react. And I'm like, wow. I'm like, holy sh we're in Dallas, Texas, in Oak Cliff, and I'm hearing submachine guns. This is not Fort Sill, because I'm used to that. It's acculturated into my head, the machine guns, that notion of that. And then you think about thousands of Native people who served in the military that were stationed at Fort Sill from the people who were the code talkers and their relationship to language and how that's defined to the relationship of the different kinds of songs that are war dance songs or songs that relate to that experience of tribal people and warriorship. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. This just happened like a week ago, so I'm still, my mind's blown that this idea of, that, of the sound and how its relationship to developing culture and identity and how militarism, war, all of it, the sounds of of the space of Fort Sill in the Wichita Mountains have defined generations of people. I don't have an answer in my head yet, but it's exciting to think like, wow, someone's doing research on this right now. A um, little bit of personal stuff, this will be quick though. In about 2009, 10, I was in Japan with Melanie Yazi and a group of artists. Uh, Melanie Yazi, very important artist um, that teaches in Colorado. She was with us after we were there in Japan and then I got back to Madison in the summertime, was teaching and we were in Japan, I noticed I had a problem with my vision. I couldn't see very well and I was hitting my head on things and I go to the doctor. My eye doctor says I need to see a brain doctor and they're saying, I do an MRI and they find a tumor that's a pituitary tumor that's the size of a lime in the middle of my skull pressing against my optic nerve causing me to go blind. I'm like, oh shit, this is tough. So this drawing's about that, so that's my illustration of the, or the talk here. And so I'm like, well what do we do? And they're like, well we gotta operate or we give you this medicine. So I tried the medicine. It kind of worked. The tumor kind of started to grow again. They ended up doing brain surgery. You go through your nose and I'm not going to do details, but they cut it out and so now it's like the size of the sliver of a lime that you put on your mixed drink or your iced tea. So it's that size now. But once you have a pituitary tumor, it's like one of, basically you have it for life. It can grow back. It's, it's, um, it's not rare, one in five people have them. Not to make you get scared, but that's like about ten, maybe 15 of us in here. But, but I, I took the hit. Mine was the largest, again, the largest freaking tumor in, that the doctors had seen. They're like, this is crazy. So anyway, to the point, there's other health things that's happened where they're like, we, need, we want you to be like studied by a geneticist to check you out and see what's your deal because you're sprouting all kinds of weird things. So this draw, I started to do a whole series of drawings about it and oh I don't have my next slide but what I did was I started to post the drawings on Facebook and I called it Drawing a Day and it really revived the practice of drawing for me because I started to illustrate the images of kind of the tumor, doing the MRIs, going through the process, the, the doctor and envisioning not having vision thinking like, oh crap, I don't have vision, I'm a musician, so I'll start teaching sound. Like I'll be creative, like I gotta find another way to like teach and live and be creative. So I, I play guitar, I can do that, I can play drums, I can play bass, I, I'll learn keyboards, like I'll start learning how to do sound manipulation and work that way. But my, you know, so I'm good, my eyes are, are back, everything's on, on the clear. 
But the drawing of the day sort of reviving my sort of practice of drawing. I do sketchbook drawings and then that started to kind of influence the process of making. And I pulled out my grandmother's beadwork again and I started to look at that beadwork as an influence on ways of thinking and also that cultural reference and also it made me feel good. Venice. Uh, in 2011, a group of artists, uh, Emily Arthur, John Hancock, Joseph Velasquez, Ryan O'Malley, and Melanie Yazzie, uh, we did an exhibition of at um, in Venice during the Biennale. And so there's several ways of exhibiting there. In this particular case, we were a collateral exhibition. So the collateral show, there's pop-up shows, there's the official be invited by your government to be there. Uh, Nancy Marie Mythelow, who's a curator, has been inviting artists, indigenous artists, to do exhibitions there for, I th it's been several years. I, I know since the, I think the 90s, I'm not, I might be off on that, but yeah, it's early 90s. Um, so being there was amazing to do an exhibition. This is John Hancock and me. We're printing again live outside. That's a Ryan O'Malley piece hanging. And we did a large exhibition in a small space and we also occupied the outside of the space. And to do an exhibition in Venice, there's a lot of rules. You, gotta, you have to have a banner. You have to have sponsorship. We had sponsorship from the universities of, of Cos Fiscari there, and we had sponsorship by the city of Venice, by the Venetians, and we had sponsorship from the different other institutions that helped us get there. And so one of the things about it is to have that place of, of gathering at this high level and this idea of exploring this platform and how important it is to be at this place, but also knowing that that shifts all the time. And also seeing such experimental work there. But one of the things that's so simple and easy was printing outside live that we drew huge crowds and we would have these awesome conversations with people coming by. And this was one of the pieces I did that I ended up traveling into other exhibitions. And I would set it up each day at different places and it's the, the thing about installation and installation work for me that I do is it's important to have it portable and like thinking in terms of my grandparents and, and even in within our cultural reference Kiowa's Comanches were always on the move everything had to be packed up put away put in the car or put in on the horse pulled taken out and so these installations for me too are in the same manner. The materials are things that I have access to. They're printed on felt. They are rolled up on paper and they're able to be put in a tube and carried on a plane or shipped easily, cheaply. One of the other things we did at the, the Biennale was to do these offerings. We went to the Galleria Academia and we would go to the different architectural spaces in the retablos and put small little prints that, like you see my buffalo head on the left and then Emily Arthur's little bird there. And we would put them as offerings all over, t all over the city. And someone's walking by in their bag, we'll throw them in their bag or stick it in someone's pocket or just hand it to people. And so it was nice. And we also did video projection at night on spaces. And so here's like a little sample. So one of the things was making connections. Like those are gourd dancers from Oklahoma at my grandparents' dance ground. The, the military reference 
But beads, the glass beads, they came from Venice originally. So we had a residency in Murano for a month making prints at the, the Venice print studio. I love that one, under the bridge. And we had a little portable projector and was doing the projections. And anyway, the glass beads, I never really made the connection until being in, in Murano and looking at the, the beads and knowing that they came from there originally. And originally, tribal plains people used a porcupine quills for, for their elements on regalia. Oh, got all heavy. So here we go. These were, we, uh, Ryan O'Malley called them print droppings. <laughs> so I thought that was funny. This was at Academia in the museum. And it was really fun to put them down and see people react and take the little prints. And this is that same piece uh, in Venice. You can see our little banner in the background, Ryan's piece. And then this was a, um, a museum in Santa Fe. The, the Museum of Contemporary Native Arts. Um, we did so Venice again in 2013, and this time it was called La Land, Air, Seed, and there were a whole grouping of artists, including um, Dwayne Slick, who I think is coming here for the residency too, and we did a huge mural where we built this whole project in the space. We screen printed in the space. Um, Ryan O'Malley was there. Um, Emily Arthur, me, and Marwan Begay, an educator from Oklahoma. So we did this all in about seven days, six days, I think. And from that experience, and again, collaborating with others, I started to kind of rethink my process of installation and started to do these pieces that were influenced by that residency. And again, everything is very easily portable and shippable, and during that whole year I did several installations. I was, this is Storms of War at Lubbock, Texas, the Louise Hopkins Underwood Center. Um, they had this beautiful red wall that they said they would paint for me if I wanted to. I'm like, no, that's just too much work. Like, just leave it. It looks awesome because I couldn't wait to put this installation on that wall. Uh, the flags, I, uh, the animals themselves are reference to Oklahoma, to the, the deer, the buffalo, the elk. Owls, owls are very important to Kiowa people and Kiowa culture, so I use owls, and owls are, in my culture, um, Kiowa, the Kiowa people, you don't, the owls are very sacred, and in a lot of cultures, it's like a, something you don't, you don't mess with. But the school I went to was Elgin Owls, from K through 12, <laughs> and it's kind of hard not to, like, avoid the owl and our owl is the white owl and also screech owls are really like not good in a sense within a cultural context of Kiowa people and so my prof teacher Juanita Pataponi who's Comanche she said she knew my grandfather she said we're going to paint a mural in the uh, um, gymnasium she said but before we do this you need to talk to your grandpa to get make sure it, you get permission to do this because you know we're going to be painting an owl because we're the Elgin owls and so we painted this huge white owl with its wings spread, and so I asked my grandfather if it was okay to do that, and he's like, yeah, yes, it's okay. So since then, I really never drew owls again, because it was freaked me out too much. But lately, in the last few years, I've actually lost uh, my grandmother, my grandfather's passed away, my, my mother, and my father, and my aunt, and my uh, close cousin, and so through that process of thinking and healing, I started to kind of use the owl as a way of looking at that as a metaphor for that shift and change and that, that medicine to another place and what it means. The flags are also kind of referencing the militarism, but also how can the animals have their own sort of like coming together and representing and, and, the, and then also the issue of conquest and what conquest brings with, with flags showing up and planted. And this is at the Museum of Wisconsin Arts. Um, my issue is trying to get dimensional because I'm very flat as a printmaker. And so this piece is called National Sanctuary. And the image itself is buffalo 
heads and their uh, scissor tail flycatchers, which is the state bird of Oklahoma and also a very important bird in Oklahoma. So I screen printed those repeat pattern all on paper, took the paper, bent it into this buffalo head shape, and then the hide itself, which is shaped of a buffalo shape, um, is naga hide. And naga hide is this faux material that's made in Wisconsin. <laughs> and it's, I love that idea of the materiality of like this thing that we, you know, it's fake. It's not real. And then this idea of keeping track again, and in paper, this kind of gives you the size, the context of the size of it. Naga hide too is, um, um, it's just an odd material, but now I'm not going to go into that. The buffalo cut shape, when I created the shape itself, I wanted to use something that was personal. And when my mother passed away, there were, she had attended uh, Sundance in South Dakota uh, four days, three days before she passed away. And when she got, when it happened, some of the, the elders from up there came to her, to her um, ceremony and they brought a buffalo hide. And that hide was very powerful. And so I wanted, my brother, since he's the oldest, he kept, he got to keep the hide. And I really wanted to kind of have a reference to that in a personal space. So I had my brother take a picture of it and he sent it by, you know, by text. And then I took that image and it was, I drew around it to make that shape. So it's the shape of the hide that my brother has. And, and so that became that reference point in sense of honoring my mother and also my grandmother and my grandfather and all those and all those who passed and all those people who, who have passed and the obvious image of the buffalo in reference to the annihilation of the buffalo and then how longevity and things come back and how we move forward. So that's a, the reference point. They all stem from this piece uh, called Traces of the Plains, which was sponsored by the North Dakota Museum. And this was at the Rauschenberg, Robert Rauschenberg Center in New York um, in 2013. And when you came in earlier, there was a video playing of dancers. And that was um, from Spirit Lake, a Sioux Reservation in North Dakota. That's the curator, Laura Ruter. She's actually from that area. And we went and we worked with artists and um, musicians or singers from that area. And we had this huge grant to do stuff. And so we invited the drum group to come to New York. And they kind of opened this, this exhibition. And this is the Naga Hyde piece that I did that's these sort of mound-like shapes um, referencing the buffalo kind of stacked up. But it was awesome to have that drum group in, um, with us in New York, and it was pretty amazing. We also did a show at Spirit Lake, too. All right, come on, machine. It's telling me to shut up, I think. <laughs> Um, metaphor for the United States of America's relationship with the indigenous nations. So to me, the layers, this layers of ideas of, of broken treaties, stolen land, relocation, colonization, Christian indoctrination, boarding schools, laws against native people is far beyond most American citizens have ever faced. And so building these tower kind of shapes with the tanks, helicopters, and there's buffalo and elk and deer shapes in between each layer here. That kind of gives you the, con the size to person and then it can be stacked up. And right now I'm working on a neon piece that's kind of related to this too. And so the, the, so the helicopters are very complicated in the notion of like native people are the largest percentage of people who serve in the military and so that honoring and that dialogue about war and assimilation versus the cultural pride of serving and the idea of how being in the military also is an important aspect of warrior, warriorism. Um, 
there's a Patty Lowe. Um, she was a professor at University of Wisconsin. Has a film called *The Way of the Warrior*, and I highly suggest watching that because it talks about. She interviews Native vets from all the wars that vets that are still alive from Vietnam to World War II to to the current wars that are going on and why they serve and what's that honoring mean and the importance of it. So, *The Way of the Warrior*, Patty Lowe, check that out. All right. This summer, I did artist residency at the Plains Indian Museum um, at the Buffalo Bill Center for the West in Cody, Wyoming. And so I traveled there to go research Kiowa Comanche, in particular beadwork. But in addition, they asked if I'd be willing to draw live and work with people as they came through the community. And so I had like a little like display area set up, which was very odd and very like, whoa, Wild Bill, I'm here being on display, cultural context, this is strange. And so I'm kind of questioning all that, but also going, this is cool, I'm, I'm a printmaker. This is just like going to print conference. <laughs> set up my goods, here I am. So I actually had a little area set, in, uh, a piece of paper here. When kids would come by, I would have them draw on, pa on the paper. And so I've got this collaboration with a group of kids that now that I'm starting to work on too. So that was fun. But so I would be drawing from photographs. And these are some of the images that I came up with. And in addition to that, I was fortunate to be able to go into the collection and look at objects and view them and draw them. Um, these are contemporary Comanche peyote um, earrings and also uh, a tie that goes on a, a front on, a, on your tie, the star shape with the peyote button in there. And so here's uh, interesting like drawing out in public, I could use water media. But when I drew, obviously, in the collection, these historic objects, or these live objects, they, they, they're, it's pretty powerful to, to witness these, these beautiful artworks. So these were uh, Comanche moccasins. And, and so I couldn't use any water media, so everything had to be kind of chalky with water media that like Japanese watercolor brushes, but couldn't dip them in water. So coming from that, returning back to my studio, looking at my grandmother's beadworks, and doing this book that I'm working on, I've come to this, The Matrix, with this idea of bringing together some of those abstractions. And to me, it's kind of a more positive approach to looking at making. And the approach that I've done in the past is very politicized, but there's political with, with making and the politics of making, but also the idea of the beauty of, of design and how that can function too. So these were the two designs that I created for the project here that we've started. And those are the, the print we finished today. I didn't get a photograph of it, but it's similar to this. It looks like that. This is a faux digital representation, but it looks just like that. <laughs> Similar. I mean, here it is. Here's us printing. And then look. <laughs> I love that shirt. I can't. I'm printing. I can't. I'm jamming. I'm in the jam room. I'm recording. No. So there's the print being made. And then uh, there you go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Thoughts? No questions? Any questions? Hey yeah. Oh, I'll start one, just a technical question. In the video you showed right at the beginning of the printmaking there in Lubbock, yeah. uh, when the printmaker put a completed print back in for another run, he seemed awfully casual about the registration. And I'm just wondering how you were able to register those prints for the multiple runs. 
I thought you were going to ch check, um, check me on my spelling because I said printer, priner, and not printer. I was wondering who was going to catch that because I had a. a but didn't want to comment on it. All right, a high school student that uh, showed the help. Anyway, she was like, "You spelled that wrong," and she's all over me about it. I'm not re-edited. I'm just living with it. But. <laughs> The registration on the particular type of press we're, we're using is an offset litho press, and so the mechanism of the registration bars, the way it grabs it, they use their feet, and so they're pushing a button, and it's lifting up these bars. They're sliding the paper underneath, and it clicks on, and then they let loose, and there's a guide that puts it right in place. It's like sure hit every time. That kind of uh, printer press we're using, I'm lying, right? <laughs> He's like, it's not right. It's not every time. It, it, it does get off register. But those types of printers are the type that were used for the newspapers, the offset litho printers. So, and it's very rare to be able to use one. And in Europe, people still use them all the time, but in the United States, they're not very common. We have one actually at UW Madison, but it's a manual, so you have to hand run it, where this is actually a machine run where it's, 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 and it's also oversized. It will print up to, those prints are 50 by 60 inches. Like those are giant, like they're big. They're the size of the painting over there. What this is, it's like, you don't get to make a print that big every day. Yeah. Hope that answered the other. Anybody? Yeah? So John, you, have, you talked a little bit about the buffalo heads and some of those other images. You also have like a lot of this kind of overall patterning, especially like all the ovals and the dots and all that. Is that influenced by beadwork or where does that kind of come from? Yeah. It's, um, it's, it is influenced by beadwork. Like, like even today when we were saying the one with the clouds, the clouds, like those little shapes become clouds. and. They're, they are referencing that, so I'm looking at how can I take an image that I'm familiar with that might be in my studio from my grandmother's. I also started collecting beadwork recently and in the last five years and other people's beadwork. And so looking at those designs and looking at how they function. And I think Jason, uh, uh, we were, um, Brandon, excuse me, Brandon and I were talking, we were in the car on the way um, out to Corky's place about um, how color influenced me more than the symbolism. Like the symbolism, my grandmother would say, hey, why don't you draw those lines like that? And she'd just make a motion. Well, she'd go like that with her lips first and then do this. <laughs> and I'd make that drawing and she's like, that looks good. Do put about 10 of those together and then make it circular. I'm like, okay. And I'm like, well, what, what do you want me to make? Just make it up. Make it. Like, make your designs. Find your design. So she was treating, teaching me how to find my shape. But she said, but the colors, those are very important. She would say that basically the, the, the reds are, are the sun and the, the day. And, the yellows and then the blues were in reference to the evening and the night. And like those are important, how you use colors. And I never thought about it until I asked her to make me a guitar strap. And in the 80s metal days, and I wanted this black guitar strap with yellow and red. And she's like, no. I was like, why? She's like, Comanches don't use black. That's like bad. You can't use black. We don't do that. I'm like, please? <laughs> and she said, ah, shook her head. And, and she did it, but it was, took a while to convince her. When she did, she secretly put in all these blue beads. I thought it was because she had bad eyes, but it was like she, did, she, she would wear, I loved it, because she would always like, have all these beads that were not in line, and then I asked her about it. I got brave enough to ask her, and she said that with beads, that it's very important to have one either missing or the coloration not in sequence. I'm like, why? She said, because that's the space in between for you to go to and go to the other side, 
or the space for knowledge to be accessed, that space, that opening for things to go back and forth, the spirits to go back and forth, the beliefs to go back and forth, for culture to move back and forth. Yeah? Courtney? Now, when you were uh, in Venice and in some of the other places in Europe, uh, what was your dialogue with the uh, people that come up and see what you're doing? Were they kind of curious about who you were in the sense or what you were up to? Yeah, there was. Uh, Dialogue with the interesting dialogue that happened was at night when we were out late, late, not partying late, late, but just out late, late, like eating food and just enjoying the the place. And one of our artists, Ryan O'Malley, built this incredible mural, and he put this mural up. Well, it's graffiti in a sense, and he wheat pasted this printed bird shape. And I didn't want to like. I'm not going to edit or tell someone they can't do anything, but I'm like, for me, I'm an educator and I'm like, I can't go out and do graffiti because I'm like, I, I'm an associate dean at the University of Wisconsin Madison. I'm like, yeah, I want to go do graffiti. That's not. <laughs> but being there and like seeing him do this and his interactions with other artists was spectacular because then I'm turning around and I'm handing little prints to people and my interaction was different but the same thing. It was like, oh wow, like I can also intercept space but also do it in a way that's not as invasive and not condemning his piece but that invasiveness of space I think was important to me as that reciprocal conversation could happen. The same way with having that piece outside and standing with it and hanging out and talking to people and so those conversations were really rich and actually we would have um, there's a lot of student base there's a couple of universities right there and the students that came through had a lot of questions and they wanted to talk about process and so that was exciting to talk about but they also want to talk about content and like why, why we're here what we're, what we're doing what's the purpose and then I tell them where I'm from and all of that and so there's these beautiful conversations fast forward two years later we're setting up at Venice again, same space, and these two young Venetians came up and they're like, you're back! I'm like, yeah, we're here! They're like, come with us now! And I'm like, okay. Five doors down, they take us to their print shop. They opened up a screen print shop. I was like, wow! They had this little space and it was two stories and upstairs they had the clean out area and downstairs they had everything like the, they had their sale shop and their works up and I'm like wow, I'm, I'm like blown away and they're like it's because you guys you know y'all were here and like we just started thinking and we, we just opened our own shop and then they said you need your screens clean and I got chills I was like yeah because I didn't know how we we're gonna clean our screens we were just going for it and so we, we just went down three four stores down and we got to clean our screens <laughs> so that community and that sort of beauty of that I think too is much like tribal communities like when you're involved with a community and you're part of that then there's this beauty of being able to operate in it and so that was like a, a warm kind of welcome like yay we kind of made it through printmaking <laughs> any other thoughts I wanted you to be invited back to the reception for this exhibition, John Quick to see Smith. It's three short, short weeks away on November 16th from 5 to 7 p.m. So she's going to give a gallery walkthrough about 6 o'clock. But can we say thanks to John for talking tonight? Thank you.